Hello, Sublation Media viewers, listeners, and future readers. It's me again, Douglas Lane. And in this Critical Cuts video, I'll continue to examine Guy Debord's 1967 book, Society of the Spectacle. And I'll continue to read it back to front. In our previous video, we examined the movie Don't Look Up in order to illustrate Debord's claim that the spectacle is creating a new sort of person. We outlined his argument that capitalism is reshaping our individual psyches. In this video, I'll take up the penultimate chapter in Debord's book, a chapter entitled Negation and Consumption Within Culture. While in the previous video, I explained why Debord thought that people under capitalism are crazy, in this video, I'll consider what sort of culture or art we disassociated, near catatonic crazy people create today and how our cultural regression has led to what everyone tells me is a great opportunity for speculative investment. In September of 2021, an artist named Beeple sold a series of digital artworks called Every Days, the first 5,000 days. He sold it at Christie's. The price he fetched was $69.3 million. The work itself is not bad especially when you consider that each image is a work a graphic designer from Charleston, South Carolina, created in a single day. But some might say that the dollar value is disproportionate to the cultural value. However, Guy Debord would argue that there is no longer a difference. According to Guy Debord, the realm of culture is best understood as a general sphere of knowledge and of representations of lived experiences within societies defined by class division and historicity. That is, unlike traditional societies that operate through cyclical time and deliberate repetition based on tradition, a society that experiences culture is linear and fundamentally secular. By linear, I mean that societies with what the board means by culture are attempting to make progress, and the distinction between the past and the present is defined by fundamental changes and advances, rather than merely by the changing of the names of the people who fulfill the same social roles as they did in the past. What justifies society is fundamentally different in societies with cultures, according to Debord. Life is no longer holy, and one doesn't look to the heavens to figure out what to do. Debord argues that people don't experience culture as culture unless they have first experienced the death of God. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. And we still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Culture as culture, or to speak directly, the spectacle, has a history, a discernible starting point. Namely, the disenchantment that is culture can be discerned starting as far back as the 17th century. It emerged and was expressed through Baroque art and architecture. This art, with its passionate theatricality, was a response to Martin Luther's Reformation. It represented a doubling down by the papacy on the power of images on the power of the church, on the power of visual representations of the divine. As Guy de Bord put it, Baroque art had to, quote, serve as its own center of unification, end quote. It was an attempt to impress, to razzle-dazzle the faithful with tricks of color and light in order to distract away from the fact that a life based on religious faith was no longer fully possible. And once Rembrandt, Rubens, and Velikus had had their say. The artworks that followed, from Romanticism to Cubism, were created as acts of negation. Debord wrote that the art that followed after Vermeer and Bach amounted to either failed attempts to impose classical order on a fragmented unreality, or failed attempts to create an avant-garde that could sublate or transcend the contradiction between freedom and the meaninglessness that modernity offered up in place of religion.
If you enjoy these videos, you should click on the subscribe button and click that bell. You should also consider supporting me on Patreon. Patrons get access to a second behind the scenes parrot room discussion where we dish out gossip or go into the weeds on topics such as the tendency of the rate of profit to decline, imperialism, and the critical theories of Tiffany Persett and Donald Most. You'll also get access to both the public and private version of the revised Pop the Left series with Ashley Frawley and Pascal Robert, and the new Zoomer Philosophy series. Your support will not only make content like this possible, it will also help to establish a new publishing venture through Diet Soap Media. Right now, supporting me on Patreon will make a big difference. Impressionism, Cubism, Dadaism, and Surrealism were all meant to fulfill the promise of freedom brought on by the Enlightenment, but their failures, DeBoard thought, were precisely what necessitated the creation of the Situationist International itself. In a spectacular society, art became commodified as the failure of bourgeois culture took hold, and we can see this failure as a regression. Take Duchamp. His oeuvre traverses the path of devolution. Post-impressionist, cubist, dadaist, surrealist, and then conceptual art. His cubist works, for instance, a piece like this portrait of chess players, attempted, like other analytic cubist work, to dissect the forms of the subject of a painting from multiple perspectives or viewpoints without regard for beauty, discernibility, or traditional perspective. These chess players are cut to pieces so that the viewer can see the true form of the scene in all of its abstractness. Duchamp's later work, like this urinal, cut away even the abstract form in order to test the limits of artistic freedom, in order, ultimately, to force the viewer to consider the category of art itself. The surrealist poet and rebel André Breton declared that Duchamp's fountain should be considered a ready-made. That is, he claimed that Duchamp had taken an ordinary object and transformed it into a work of art simply by choosing to display it as art. And according to Wikipedia, Duchamp's ready-made fountain was voted as the most influential artwork of the 20th century. Perhaps one of the 20th century artists who was most influenced by Duchamp would be Andy Warhol. If you read one of the major critics of Warhol after reading Breton's quote on Duchamp, the influence is detectable. Even though the power that bestows the designation of art onto Warhol's boxes is different, perhaps the opposite of the power that Breton pointed to. Arthur Danto and George Dickey argued that rather than the artist, it is an art world or a culture of interpretation that bestows an artistic meaning on any given work. However, as time has passed, the culture of interpretation needed to create an art world has melted into thin air, and the real material basis of art has very nearly been revealed. To fully understand the society of the spectacle, this near catatonic art world, we should turn away from Debord and Danto and consider another critical art theorist named Walter Benjamin. In his essay, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, he wrote, Even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. This unique existence of the work of art determined the history to which it was subject throughout the time of its existence. This includes the changes which it may have suffered in physical condition over the years, as well as the various changes in its ownership. Now, Walter Benjamin wanted to free us from the power of the aura, to be rid of the mark of authenticity that gives fine art authority. And he believed that in the age of mechanical reproduction, we were achieving this goal of demystifying art. However, in this age of digital reproduction, that aura has been reestablished technologically. The aura of an artwork once transformed into a non-fungible token, it is preserved with the very computer network that makes its reproduction and distribution so cheap and so easy. Using blockchain technology, 
one can trace the work's history, and what was impossible to perform in the age of mechanical or analog artworks is now as simple as a click. In an age of digital reproduction and non-fungible tokens, the authority bestowed on a work doesn't arrive through the development of aesthetic theory or even philosophical inquiries into epistemic problems, but rather it is given as a quantitative value and quickly summed up as a measurement in dollars, pounds, yen, euros, or rands. The board saw that the beginning of the end of art, the death of culture, arose at the moment of art's arrival as a secular value. He claimed that the theatricality of Baroque art presaged a disconnect between subjective meaning and the objective or natural world. Duchamp's urinal and Warhol's brillo boxes exposed how abstract, how vapid, the one-sided subjectivity of capitalist modernity had become. And now artworks have been reduced to a monetizable aura of authenticity preserved through a blockchain. De Board wrote, the real values of culture can be maintained only by actually negating culture. But this negation can no longer be a cultural negation. It may in a sense take place within culture, but it points beyond it. Today, our culture really has been negated, at least on the level of fine art. The Dadaist aim of abolishing art and the surrealist aim of realizing it have both been achieved by the creators of a bored ape. What's left for those who want to take up the situation as challenge is to change the material conditions, to defeat the aura, to bring down financial capital, cryptocurrency speculation, and most of all, the class, exploitation, and commodity production that sustains both. Art has been replaced by technology and the aura of authenticity. But in order to realize art as something we live, as something we can create socially and that can sustain us, we'll have to negate even the remnants of culture we find in bored apes every day. In this society of the spectacle, there is no shared art world left. And it's up to us to create one. The development of class society to the stage of the spectacular organization of non-life is thus leading the revolutionary project to become visibly what it has always been in essence. Revolutionary theory is now the enemy of all revolutionary ideology, and it knows it. <laughs>